So I'm going to talk to you today about recommendation challenges in web media settings. And um, to start off, I'll give a brief introduction to recommender systems, which I'm sure you've all interacted with uh, multiple times uh, over even the past few days. So the area of recommender systems was pioneered in the mid-90s by Amazon. I'm sure you've all seen interfaces such as that, where after shopping a little bit in Amazon, you would see recommendations telling you that people who did similar actions to you were also interested in these few items. Um, this notion became very popular. It, it became a huge success at Amazon, increased their revenues significantly. And today, the same ideas are applied basically everywhere. So you can see them in shopping sites like Amazon and others, in content sites where people come to consume content, news articles, and so forth, in multimedia streaming sites, whether they stream videos like YouTube or, mu or music streaming sites, social networks. Now, this is a huge field. Um, it has a dedicated conference, it has dedicated tracks in other conferences, and it easily merits an academic course. At a high level, there are two basic techniques of recommendation. The first is content-based, where basically the systems compute the affinity of users to certain features of the items being recommended. It can be uh, hardcore content features or metadata, for example, in, in the movie case, who are the actors, who is the director, what is the genre of the movie and so forth. And behind the scenes, there is a lot of classification technology going on to classify whether this item is applicable to that user. And then the second technique is called collaborative filtering, by which the systems exploit consumption pattern similarity uh, between different users to identify uh, what users like the person who is now in front of the system like, and then they would tap those preferences to recommend to the current user. Now, of course, most state-of-the-art systems combine somehow these two flavors. At a very high level, collaborative filtering uh, takes as input a consumption matrix R of users and items, where the IK entry in the matrix corresponds to whether user I has consumed item K, or if this is a, a domain with explicit ratings, how did user I rate item K? Now, the problem is that this matrix is always very sparse. Most users do not consume most items. And typically, or in, in many cases, also very large. So you can think of the number of users as the number of users who, for example, uh, use YouTube. Fairly large number of users uh, ordered in the hundreds of millions. Now, most real-life applications of recommender systems, the task is to what, what is called top K recommendation. What are the top three, five, ten items we should show to the user at this time or recommend to the user at this time? This is a bit different than what is typically found in academic settings of um, matrix completion. And the matrix completion problem talks about here's a matrix, uh, only, a very, only very few items there are known. How can we complete in a probable way the missing entries of the matrix or namely, how can we predict the ratings or amount of likings of items that were not yet consumed by users? In this talk, um, I'll focus more on collaborative filtering and on its application to web media sites. And what I'll talk about is not so much what we know, but actually what we still do not know, questions that are in the forefront of uh, true applications and that are, in some respect, underrepresented in the literature. So you, typically when you read about recommender systems in the papers, you would not see these things being discussed. Some of them are, some, but many of them aren't. Now here's a laundry list of the examples I'm gonna cover. We're not gonna go through this now. As we cover them, uh, we'll talk about each specific one. And my hope is actually to drive some research into these topics, so I encourage each and every one of you to look into this domain, it's, it's an amazingly rich and interesting uh, domain with, with very hard problems. And the more we can bring people into this domain, uh, the faster we can accelerate innovation in recommender systems. So as I said, I'm gonna focus mostly on web media sites. And what do I mean by web media sites? I'll just show you a few examples and I'm sure you'll get it. So this is MSN. This is Ynet, a leading uh, media site in Israel. And this is AOL. You can see that at a high level, they all look pretty similarly. Um, a bunch of stories divided into sections pointed on from a page. 
uh, also videos that you can consume, also images that are shown. Everything here um, is applicable for recommendation. Even the ads that are shown here can be personalized and targeted with recommender technology. So these are the type of sites this talk will mostly be concerned about. And the first problem uh, or challenge I want to throw out there is about perpetual cold start problems. So before we talk about the perpetual problems, let's uh, understand that to generate good recommendations, recommender systems must observe some data on the user being recommended to or uh, equivalently on the items being recommended. So we must see some history of what did this user consume before, who consumed this item before, before we can understand the matchings between users and items. Now, the user cold start problem deals with users who are new to a system. So they arrive at a recommendation system. The system has no history about that user, but still the system would like to make a good first impression on the user and, and be relevant and be useful. The flip side for items is we now get, have a new item in our inventory to recommend, but nobody has ever consumed this item. How do we route this item to applicable users? Um, and the extreme in the perpetual cold state uh, scenarios or cold start scenarios, we have scenarios where all users are always new, uh, basically um, advertising scenarios where the campaign is such that we only see a person once and we need to somehow decide what ad to target this person, or items that are ephemeral, they have very short lifetimes and uh, basically think of a news recommendation scenario. A, new dies, a news item comes in, it's relevant now for a certain subset of the population, but in a very short while it's gonna be old news. So how do we deal with that? Now luckily, media sites have an advantage of their false positives resulting in relatively low cost. And what do I mean by a false positive? It's a case where you recommend an irrelevant item to a user. Now, as a consequence on the media side, this would typically result in, you know, a few seconds of dissatisfaction to the user. And you can contrast that with the Amazon situation or perhaps with a Netflix situation where the user will either spend money on a bad item or spend a significant amount of time, let's say a couple of hours, watching a movie that turns out to be not interesting. So the fact that in media sites the false positive cost is relatively low opens up opportunities to better handle cold start uh, issues. For example, think of an item cold start problem and think of an optimization problem we can now formulate of can we identify the best subset of users to show this item to, to quickly model the item. Now, we're perfectly willing to accept that some of these users who we will show this item to might be disappointed by it. But can we somehow optimize this set of users so as uh, with minimal cost in terms of how many users we disappoint, can we quickly learn who likes and who does not like this item? Same thing about users. So we want to learn about users. We can be very conservative and only show users very popular stories uh, and see you know, which stories they interact with. Or we can be a little bit more aggressive, a little bit more adventurous, show a new user stories from all corners of our domain we know that some of those may disappoint the user, but maybe we can model that user uh, quicker. And again, you can formalize optimization problems around those um, statements. And then uh, let's, inf let's see how we can infer interactions and satisfaction. So I started with a very nice uh, modeling of a matrix that actually tells you who consumed what and how perhaps how much every user liked every item. That's not always the case. So whereas in the literature, the dominant model of input is based on triplets of user consumed an item and rated it with this rating, um, that's not always the case in real life. So in many recommendation settings, you have no idea what the rating would be. You have no explicit feedback of the user on the item, but actually you only have binary consumption data. Now, this uh, has been observed in the literature and you actually see now papers coming out that talk about binary consumption models where you just know that a user consumed an item but not how they liked it or if they liked it. But then the question becomes, what about items the user did not consume? So was the user even aware of these items that they did not consume? 
And this, the underlying question is, what items did the recommender system actually expose the user to? Now in pop culture, in Amazon for books, or Netflix for movies, or, or music streaming uh, services, this is far less important because I'm sure uh, most of the audience is aware of this book and this band and that movie, even though they've been, you know, the movie has been produced, was produced in 42, the book is from the 20 or, 20s or 30s, and the Beatles broke up in 1970. So even though um, the recommender system may not actually expose you to these items, you're aware of them simply because you've been around uh, and, and you've encountered those items culturally. But in media sites, especially if, you, if we look at news recommendations, if the system did not expose you to an item, most chances are you are not aware that this item is available. And this is what we call presentation bias, meaning that you're only free to choose from among what is presented to you because you simply are, is, are not aware of the inventory of things that you have not been presented with by the system. And so we must correctly account for items that the person saw and did not select or did not consume versus items the user simply was not exposed to and naturally did not consume. So if we need to accurately account for that, let's think about search engines for a second because they had a, a similar problem and a very nice observation was that we can base negative feedback in search results on the notion of skips. Um, this is an 11 year old notion and the basic idea is if I search for something, let's say the TCE conference, and I get some links back and I click on a couple, in this case on the items in positions one and three, but do not click on item number two, I can consider that as a negative example of the user not liking item number two. So, okay, fine. So in cases where we display in media sites items in a vertical layout, we can take this skips analogy and uh, tap that to infer uh, what the user saw and did not uh, click or consume. But what about other types of uh, layouts? What about 2D layouts? How do users consume 2D layouts? Uh, what does it mean to skip in a 2D layout? And is it the same across all users or do different users sort of go through tables of items in the same order or not? The same with tabbed interfaces and horizontal layouts. So in a horizontal layout, do people scan from left to right or right from left? Or maybe the center item is the one that is first looked at. These are all areas of active research and they're important for understanding how did users express negative feedback on items. Now, even if we go back to vertical lists and you know we have the skip notion, if someone consumes an item, then everything above that that was not consumed can be considered negative. That's not always the case when the items have very different uh, presentation formats. So if a salient item was skipped, that might mean something very different than if a less salient item, one that is shown, let's say, without an image was clicked. Maybe the user simply didn't grasp the um, item that is not shown as dominantly on the page. Okay, so we have to understand all of that. Now, beyond consumption, can we infer satisfaction? So can we analyze what happened to a web page after the click and maybe infer from that whether the user actually liked the story that was clicked? Or with short online videos, what happened after the user pressed play? Did they watch the whole thing? Did they rewind and repeat certain uh, areas? Did they just you know, pause the video after 10 seconds and go away? And with TV programs, did the TV viewers zap or did they stay on that program and so forth? So great, uh, maybe we can do, maybe we can analyze some satisfaction beyond interactions, but in some cases we're even not sure about the interaction itself. So we're not even con con uh, certain of whether the user actually consumed the item. And here's an example. So again, the TV domain. Let's ask ourselves, is anybody watching the program currently on? So if we have knowledge of a zapping event, so a person actually manipulated the remote control at a certain time, we have pretty high confidence that at least at that specific instance, someone was watching the TV. As time passes, our confidence diminishes in the fact that the person who manipulated the remote is actively still watching the program. And when the program ends, there's a good possibility 
that um, people are no longer watching the TV, even if it's on, in lack of evidence such as another manipulation of the remote control. Now, as time passes, we can be fairly certain that perhaps the TV is on, but uh, the person is asleep. Okay, so no consumption is happening right now. So these are areas where even the binary fact of did the user consume the item is far from certain. Okay, let's switch gears and talk about uh, different types of recommendations. So this is an actual uh, screenshot of a web media site. Uh, this case, uh, it's, it's Yahoo. We have a story in the center. And then we have the possibility to explore related context. So these would be stories that are similar to the story being read now, uh, right now. We also have uh, today on Yahoo, which basically is a code word for these are popular items that many people are reading today. And also news for you, which means personalized for you. So how do we reconcile all these different um, recommendation types? And specifically, how do we um, mesh recommendations coming from what is contextually relevant to the story, what is personalized to you, what is popular, and uh, what is uh, known as social, meaning stories that are consumed or items that are consumed by your specific friends right now. And we have to be aware that um, when trying to create unified lists, things aren't as obvious as they may seem. And specifically, um, in some cases, if you ignore story context, you might create offending recommendations. And just, I can throw out an example if, um, if a person is reading a very somber story about, let's say, a natural disaster or an earthquake or something, even that, if that user is typically inclined to read um, about the latest exploits of Paris Hilton, it may not you know, mesh well with the user to receive a recommendation for another silly Paris Hilton escapade while reading something about a natural disaster. Um, so we need to take everything into account. Uh, luckily, there is uh, one promising direction called tensor factorization that may be able to provide uh, a framework to consider context and personalization together in, in one modeling approach. Okay, let's talk about repeated recommendations. What is this all about? Again, this is something that you don't typically see in, in the mainstream line of papers. And that's because typically people do not buy the same book twice on Amazon, nor do they typically read the same news story in web media sites. However, people listen to songs they like over and over again, many times, and people also may watch movies uh, more than one time, more than two times, and you know, the Rocky Horror Picture Show was a cult movie that are people who have seen it dozens of times. So how do we try to then recommend when we are also allowed to and sometimes expected to recommend items that were already consumed. So when and how frequently is it reasonable to recommend an item that was already consumed? If you saw a movie yesterday, most likely you don't want to see it again today. But if you heard a good song yesterday, maybe you do want to listen to it again today. How do you reconcile those things? Now, if it's okay to recommend things over and over again, and if a system now takes the liberty to repeat recommendations, when should it stop? So if I recommend an item to you and you don't consume it today, that's fine, maybe I try again tomorrow. If you don't consume it again tomorrow, do I try again the day after tomorrow? When do I stop? And if I want to reason about that, this nice two-dimensional matrix of users and items no longer provides the input to um, incorporate these types of considerations because now, if items are consumed multiple times, I need a timeline of when each item was consumed. And I also need a timeline of when did I actually present this item to the user? When did I recommend each item? And how, or what was the response at each time? So now, this 2D matrix is a 3D matrix with a time axis of when were the multiple consumptions or multiple recommendations of each item to or by a user. And I also want to talk about diversity of recommendations. So consider a system uh, w which has some users and those users come every day to the system and they get top 10 recommendations. One aspect of diversity is on a given day to a given person, am I recommending diverse enough 
items. So these can be diverse enough books or stories or news articles or songs. Um, now this notion is pretty well understood and again I, I can freely borrow from the search domain where diversifying uh, search lists has long been an uh, area of study. So this is relatively well understood. But what about if I look at the diversity at a certain day across all users? What does that teach me and what should I uh, take into account? So for example, the more diverse a set of recommendations to different users is at a different point of time, it means that I'm personalizing more aggressively. I'm, I'm far less conservative, I'm not perpetuating the popular items as much, but I'm also taking more risks. So how do we quantify that and do we actually want to measure recommendation systems based on this type of diversity? Now, the next type of diversity I want to talk about is the diversity across a set of repeated recommendations day after day or hour after hour to the same person. After all, even if on day one I gave Albert Einstein the perfect set of recommendations, I typically would not want to recommend the same set over and over again as Albert comes into my system to um, consume more, more items. Um, the last challenge I'll talk about is about recommending sets and sequences of items. So in many domains, items are consumed, multiple items are consumed in rapid succession. Think about um, movie, uh, not movie, but actually music playlists. You typically come to a system, you want to listen to an hour of music. That would be 12, 13, 14 different items. So recent works uh, from last year tried to model these uh, problems as set recommendation instances or sequence recommendation instances. Um, lots of nice algorithmic ideas hiding there. And the basic notion is that the utility stops being a sum over the utilities of individual items, but actually utility now becomes a set function or a sequence function since there are dependencies and you need to recommend items that mesh well together. Um, this is an extension of diversity. It's pretty interesting. In, in a TV uh, case, you now have even further constraints of what is on the TV at every point in time and maybe programs that the person would have liked to watch are overlapping. So this might open up a new domain of constraint recommendations. I'm gonna skip uh, these last uh, two slides or maybe it's just one and um, I'll open it up for questions. So thank you very much.